First of all, a, a warm welcome. I'm Denise Leavesley, the principal of Green Templeton College, and I'd like to welcome uh, those of you who've been at these seminars before, welcome you back to the latest in the series, and those of you who haven't been to these seminars before to, to welcome you warmly to the Oxford Centre for the Study of Philanthropy, which is an initiative started a, a few months ago and is um, in cooperation with Green Templeton College, um, right next door. So um, let me just say a few words about uh, the centre and some of the activities of the centre, and then I'll introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, so the centre was set up in order to promote research, um, so the study of philanthropy, and to do this by bringing together people with common interests around different aspects of philanthropy. Um, and the seminars and lectures are part of, of that series. But also we're embarking on, on um, actually carrying out research um, on philanthropy. And so watch this space. There will be more developments in, in that area in the near future. So developing a, an original research agenda and also commissioning and promoting, initiating research um, carried out by others on this topic. Um, this is working out, I think, is the fifth in the series of seminars? Fourth, is it? Yeah, the fourth, sorry. Um, so we had, first of all, we had uh, a seminar on the history of British philanthropy. Um, that Frank Prochaska gave. Then we had a talk on why philanthropy matters in the 21st century with uh, Professor Zoltanax. And then um, the uh, last one was whether there was a right approach to family philanthropy with Inika Cole. Um, tonight we're turning our attention to philanthropy in British higher education looking at what currently happens and also looking at what should happen. And the system of these seminars, for those of you who haven't been before, is that we have a main speaker. We're very grateful to uh, Professor Sarik Trainer for being our speaker tonight. Um, he will speak and then we'll start a discussion and then we'll take a break for some food and we'll continue with the discussion of the topic. Um, so it's very informal and we're pleased that as well as having um, people from different areas of expertise with respect to philanthropy around the table, we've also got some, some students um, and that's wonderful and my experience of previous seminars is that they um, are welcomed as full participants in, in the discussion. Um, so let me introduce tonight's speaker. Um, I was just saying to, to Rick that I think it's the first time I've had to introduce him, despite the fact that for six years he was my boss. Um, so I moved here um, six weeks ago from King's College London, and Rick moved here a year and six weeks ago <laughs> uh, from King's College London, where he was principal. Um, and Rick is, is now the rector of uh, Exeter College um, here in Oxford. He is an absolutely fabulous person to be addressing this topic this evening because as well as being um, principal of King's College London, which I would say, I would say this, wouldn't I? Because I've still got a lot of my heart is still in King's College London, is doing fabulously well in relation to uh, philanthropy for higher education. But Rick, as well as, as being principal, he was um, head of Universities UK um, for two to three years. Um, and also he was, and this is very important in, in respect of this topic, 
he sat on the board of the HEFSI Review of Phil Philanthropic um, Support for UK Higher Education. So he's not only got perspective of um, university uh, in London and previous universities, Greenwich where he was principal before, um, and Glasgow University before that where he was vice principal. So um, experience of different universities and now over a year um, at Oxford, which makes him a hold, an old hand as far as I'm concerned. Um, but he also has, through his University's UK work and his HEFSI work, got a, uh, a broader perspective on the, these issues. So, Rick, you're very welcome. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And we pass across to you to, to give us some thoughts on this topic. Well, thank you very much, Denise. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be introduced by you and to be giving a seminar in a center associated with your college. Um, and, and I'm very pleased to have been invited to speak in this new a series for this new Center for the Study uh, of Philanthropy because, as will become evident from my talk, I believe this is a very important area of activity, philanthropy in uh, higher education. So a Center for the Study of it is obviously a, a welcome development. And I, th I think I should also say that it's um, a privilege to speak in a series in which the first paper was given by a highly distinguished historian of philanthropy in the, the form of Frank Prohaska. So my general question this evening is, what role should philanthropy play in British higher education? And I propose to address it by discussing briefly in each case a, a series of topics. First, what's the longer term history of such giving and what are the implications of that history? Second, what's been the more recent history since, say, the 1990s of private giving to UK higher education? Then how realistic are current projections of further sharp increases in such giving during the next several years? I then want to look at what the implications are of rising philanthropy for the balance between the private and public funding of UK higher education. I want to look at what the benefits to UK universities are of such giving, and of course also examine the question of possible countervailing disadvantages. Then I want to look at the impact of increasing philanthropy on a few key aspects of the UK higher education sector, specifically, and this was suggested by <coughs> Charles, uh, teaching and research, the higher education workforce, and competition between universities. I want to deal a, a glancing blow to the topic of the implications of the very recent government green paper on higher education for philanthropy. And then finally, before uh, an attempt at a brief summary, I want to mention what seem to me the key research questions about philanthropy that need to be pursued. Now, D Denise has pointed out that I was a member of uh, Hefke's Pierce Review of Philanthropy in UK Higher Education. I'll certainly be drawing on that experience and also on the experience of the subsequent uh, implementation group that focused on the um, workforce in um, uh, higher education philanthropy. I do so with a bit of trepidation in the presence of Joanna Motion because she played an absolutely pivotal role. I was just a board member in both cases in the both stages of, of that endeavor. But I should in any case make clear that I'm not speaking for those reviews in any sense this is a personal view. I'm going to be drawing a little bit on my scholarly work on philanthropy, um, inspired by the path-breaking work on the history of philanthropy of my DPhil supervisor from the 1970s, Brian Harrison. I included philanthropy and other aspects of voluntary activity as major topics in my doctoral work on the urban elites of the Victorian black country. And I've done the same in subsequent work both on Glasgow's elites and on British urban elites and the middle class which largely constituted them. For such activities were a major aspect of urban leadership in Britain in the Victorian and Edwardian periods and in my view to a significant degree up to and indeed beyond 1945. 
And I'll also be drawing on my work on a major aspect of British elite activity, the universities, especially my 2001 co-authored book on the modern history of the University of Glasgow. Now inevitably, I'm also going to be drawing on my personal experience of fundraising and of more general academic leadership. And that work, as Denise has pointed out, has been uh, following on from uh, an apprenticeship, if you will, at the University of Glasgow, at the University of Greenwich, where I inherited an alumni relations operation and made the, the first tentative steps to set up a fundraising operation. At King's College London, where I inherited major activity in both fundraising and alumni relations and significantly expanded both. And during the last 14 months, at Exeter College Oxford, which was already a flourishing center, both of alumni activity and of fundraising. And I'm pleased that uh, the director and deputy director of uh, development uh, at Exeter are with us this evening. But again, I don't want to emphasize that I am not speaking for any of those institutions. These are personal reflections. And I intend them as personal reflections to stimulate debate rather than uh, to attempt prematurely to shut down discussion. To begin, a frequently heard view about the longer term history of British university philanthropy holds that it began in earnest only during the last couple of decades. Yet as scholarship has increasingly demonstrated, for example in David Canadine's recent Wolfson lecture, this is a profoundly ahistorical view. Looking back to the early modern period, arguably the UK invented higher education philanthropy and then exported it to the emerging United States and then to the British dominions. Also within Britain, right down to 1939, UK higher education relied primarily, in addition to tuition fees, on private giving, both large scale and small scale. A spectacular case, excuse me, <coughs> I've got the lingering effects of fresher's flu here, I'm afraid. <laughs> a spectacular case was the University of Glasgow, which moved itself in the mid-19th century from its medieval site in the city centre to the prosperous suburbs on the city's edge. A government grant greatly assisted, but this had to be matched by voluntary giving. Such philanthropy consisted not only of large donations by wealthy individuals, such as the Marcus of Butte, but also of many much smaller donations from alumni and other local citizens. So I conclude that there's nothing in the DNA of the people of the UK which is hostile to private giving to universities. But it can't be denied that there was a long hiatus in such philanthropy. After 1945, such fundraising took a massive hit, both on the demand side and the supply side. Starting with the Attlee government, UK public spending on universities rose massively, and marginal tax rates on prospective donors rose to prohibitive levels. Encouraged also by the emergence of meritocratic admissions and government grants to students, the assumption emerged that the financing of British higher education was a public responsibility. Thus, although some substantial private giving persisted, as revealed by the interesting recent study of so-called hidden philanthropy at the University of Kent, it greatly reduced in importance, with the significant exception of research support from foundations such as Leverhulme, Wellcome, and Wolfson. So too did attention to alumni affairs, even in Scotland where the law required that lists of graduates be kept. A significant partial exception, of course, can be found in the Oxbridge Colleges, with their gaudies and old members. At Exeter College, Oxford, taking an example not quite at random, <laughs> donations from alumni were key to the completion of the Marguerite or back quad in the 1960s and again in the 1980s. But the national trend was in the opposite direction. In terms of general patterns, it took the so-called Thatcher cuts in universities of the 1980s and the rapidly declining unit of resource as enrollments rapidly expanded up to about the year 2000 to reawaken UK universities to the importance of taking seriously
both alumni relations and fundraising. There were early revivals of both in a number of universities, especially the oldest, from about 1990, notably at King's College of London and Glasgow. This upsurge was soon accompanied by gearing up in Oxbridge colleges and at the university level in both Oxford and Cambridge. The general upward trend was measured and publicized by the 2004 Thomas Report on voluntary giving to UK universities. As in American state universities, which on the whole had started taking fundraising seriously only from the 1980s, as cuts in funding from state legislatures hit home, UK universities were moving in the same direction, countering, as their American cousins had to counter, the argument that the government would, or at least should, provide. And this trend has continued. The Pierce Review detected a substantial further rise in UK higher education philanthropy, up 35% in the five years between 2006-07 and 2011-12, that is from 513 million pounds in the former year to 693 million pounds in the, the latter year, in excess of the goal that the Thomas Report had set of 600 million pounds per year. Likewise, while many large gifts fueled this rise, there were also many small ones. The number of donors in the same period rose from 132,000 in 2006-07 to 204,000 in 2011-12. These increases in giving were substantial in the institutions most active by the early 21st century. In addition, encouraged by the government's matched funding initiative of 2008-11, Many institutions previously inactive, including many post-1992 universities, began such operations. The number of seriously active institutions increased from 131 to 152 between the dates that I've been analyzing here, 2006-07 on the one hand and 2011-12 on the other. Well, why has this upsurge occurred? The Thomas Report, and the sector-wide actions which flowed immediately from it certainly played their part. So too did an increasing sense of competition among UK universities and with universities abroad, including those in the United States which had been earlier, sometimes much earlier, in drawing significant income from private giving. Coping with such competitors and satisfying the increasing expectations of UK students who of course from 1998 were paying fees, led to a realization that significantly more resource was needed. Meanwhile, there was an increasingly clear awareness, despite the rise in UK government support for research in the early years of this century, that the required leap in resources would not come substantially from the public purse. The fee rise to 3,000 pounds from 2006 and we have to remember that that was inspired directly by the argument that universities needed more funds, was helpful, but it was limited in scope. And then hopes of further increases in resources were dashed in the wake of the so-called Great Recession starting in 2008 by the coupling of the 9,000 pound fee, in, uh, the increase to 9,000 pound fees with a massive cut in public finance of H higher education teaching, coupled with a level cash approach to the public finance of higher education research. So the need was clear. Other factors contributing to the recent upsurge in giving to UK universities have been an increasing realization by donors of the importance of higher education to the country's economic, social and cultural welfare a very significant liberalization of UK tax encouragement of philanthropic giving, including to universities, and the beginnings of a serious British higher education fundraising profession with a flair for major campaigns as well as for annual giving. Admittedly, a major gap in university fundraising persists vis-a-vis -vis the USA which remains, for instance, way ahead in terms of average alumni participation rates. 
But the upsurge in UK higher education fundraising over the last 15 years or so means that the UK-US comparison can at last be meaningful. Meanwhile, UK efforts are increasingly seen as models in other countries which have turned seriously to fundraising even later. This raises the issue of prospects for the future. In particular, how realistic are projections of further sharp increases in giving to universities? I have in mind particularly the Pierce Review projection of up to two billion pounds per annum by 2022. That's compared to the figure I mentioned before of just under 700 million in 2011-12. The most recent set of annual statistics, at least the most recent set I found, the Ross case figures for academic year 2013-14, show many positive trends. A rising number of institutions securing more than 10 million pounds per year, for example, and a rise in donor numbers of 25% compared to two years before. Further acceleration will be required, especially as the most successful institutions have retained their large shares of the philanthropic total. Yet despite some winding down of programs in less successful institutions, fundraising and systematic alumni relations continue to prosper, at least modestly, in places like my old institution, the University of Greenwich. Meanwhile, in marked contrast to a decade ago, it's now inconceivable that any major UK university would abandon significant fundraising efforts. But I end this section on a note of caution related to the imminent announcement of the Comprehensive Spending Review, or CSR, of the UK government, which I think we're going to get next week. If it brings major cuts to the funding of UK higher education, this could have a negative effect on university fundraising, particularly if donors came to feel that their donations were simply making up for spending that the exchequer was no longer prepared to provide. In a mixed system of university finance, such as that in the UK, a reliable base of public funding seems to me a prerequisite for substantial fundraising. With regard to the implications of higher education fundraising for the balance between private and public funding of the sector, the long-term shift toward greater reliance on private sources is irresistible, whatever happens to university philanthropy. Also, at least in advance of the dreaded CSR, public funding remains important not least with regard to research assessment, from which Oxford gets, for example, gets well over 100 million pounds a year, research council grants, and government source student loans. Also, in terms of autonomy, depending how, on how relations with donors are structured and managed, and those are topics to which I'll return in a moment, philanthropy holds out advantages to universities and colleges regarding control of their own activities. For with regard to fee income in particular, in the UK as in the US, there is no sign that decreasing public funding brings decreasing government regulation. Which other benefits does such philanthropic giving bring to UK universities? Its greatest advantage is to enlarge the scope and quality of what universities can do. Such philanthropy provides faculty posts in innovative areas and enhances facilities and financial aid, including hardship bursaries and postgraduate scholarships for students. Also, in those institutions with a large regular flow of small and medium-sized contributions, often institutionalized as the annual fund, there can be a benefit to the bottom line of the institution's income and expenditure account. But overall, that's not the major benefit, in part because the extra scope of activities that philanthropy permits often actually increases operating costs. And it's a rare fundraiser who can persuade a donor to write a large check to subsidize miscellaneous expenses. Instead, donors typically want to invest, to be involved in imaginative new ventures 
or in plans for sustained transformation, as in the more attainment gifts to Oxford for students from low-income families. In a more general way, philanthropy helps to bind institutions more tightly to their broader communities of students, parents, and especially of alumni. This works particularly well when universities mobilize significant numbers of donors and of other types of alumni volunteer alongside fewer very large philanthropists. The interaction between alumni relations and fundraising, though complex, can be extremely positive. Well, are there significant countervailing disadvantages of such giving to universities? Generally, the net cost of fundraising is substantial only in the startup phase. Afterward, development efforts more than pay for themselves, usually far more than pay for themselves. The Ross case figures for 2014, for example, indicate that the co average cost of fundraising in UK universities was only 25p in the pound. And it's interesting to note that the gross returns of fundraising were very positively correlated with the size of fundraising staffs in individual institutions. Now, gifts might conceivably distort university strategy. After all, the agenda of donors may not be the same as the agenda of the universities to which they contemplate giving. Fundraising is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Yet if universities and colleges approach fundraising with a clear sense of priorities, they can do much to reduce this risk by helping to shape dialogues with prospective funders. The ethical dimension demands more sustained analysis. I'm thinking especially of the risks that donors may obtain undue influence, or even if they don't, may damage the reputation of institutions. If the perceived values of donors conflict with those of the university in question. Well-drawn gift agreements and careful conversations surrounding them should remove any possibility that donors will attempt to control the operations, most especially the academic appointments, of the parts of universities that they are funding. Also, in my view, donors tend to be well aware of these principles, and they have an interest in the increasing academic prestige of the institutions that they are funding. <coughs> With regard to the reputational risks highlighted by the Wolf Report of 2011, there must be a rigorous process of vetting. This procedure, in turn, must have real independence from fundraisers and close ties to the governing body or council of the institution. Of course, reputations of donors can go down as well as up. As recent experience in this university shows, controversies about philanthropists can erupt at any time. As a one-time Rhodes Scholar, I'm <laughs> conscious of the vulnerability of the founder's reputation um, more than a hundred years after his death. Yet such real risks, increasingly mitigated in the sector in the ways that I've suggested, must be seen in the context of the considerable benefits that a successful fundraising effort brings to universities. I come now to the topic of the increasing, of the impact of increasing philanthropy on three topics, teaching and research, the higher education workforce, and competition between universities. In theory, there's a risk that philanthropy may shift teaching and research too much in the applied direction. But in practice, many philanthropists are interested in pure research and teaching. As I discovered when, while I was UUK president, I served as a member of a CBI task force on higher education. I may say parenthetically, they didn't always begin from that position, but uh, they often got there in the end. <laughs> The effect on those who work in universities is more profound, especially for those in leadership positions. In order to raise significant sums, as is well known, heads of institutions and their most immediate colleagues need to allocate significant time to fundraising and to alumni relations. 
donors expect to interact with the heads of universities and colleges. And these heads now understand this well, as is implied by the commitments in the 2013 report of Universities UK called Strategic Fundraising. To a lesser but significant extent, the same applies to senior academics, who should be prepared to speak persuasively to prospective and current donors about their research and teaching. Of course, such reallocations of time entail an opportunity cost, and allowances need to be made in terms of the other duties of such individuals. But in my view, it's a mistake to see such fundraising and alumni activities as discontinuous with the other preoccupations of these individuals. After all, in our age of accountability and impact, quote unquote, these other duties increasingly involve the representation and promotion of institutions to a wider public. And I think it should also be kept in mind that a significant proportion of fundraising interaction is with foundations, that is, with other charities. Effective fundraising and alumni activities are made practicable by the intensive interaction of institutional leaders and senior academics with their colleagues who are fundraising professionals. They do the hard detailed work and also much of the imaginative work with alumni and with donors large and small. The key issue here, as recognized by the 2014 report by Moore Partnership and Richmond Associates on the higher education philanthropy workforce, is the need to encourage this fledgling profession through additional positions and career development, including structured training, study, and certification. With regard to competition between universities, such rivalry, which is of course a very long standing, has increased and will continue increasing for a wide variety of reasons. It's not simply to do, or even I think mainly to do, with philanthropic giving. Also, insofar as such competition is fueled by fundraising, as long as the competition doesn't get out of hand, the intensified rivalry should ultimately be to the net benefit of the staff and students of the universities in question and of the wider society. Well, what about the impact of government policy? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> notably the very recent Green Paper on English Higher Education. As far as I can tell, I can't claim I've read every word of the Green Paper, but I have looked at every page anyway, <laughs> and I can't find anything in it about philanthropy, which is a bit worrying. Also, some of the Green Paper's proposals may cause philanthropic difficulties for the sector as a whole. This may be especially true of the proposed stratification through a teaching excellence framework into four ranked divisions of institutions, because this will arguably diminish the domestic and especially the international prestige of UK higher education as a whole. One can just imagine what the Straits Times or the Times of India will make of the first publication of that league table. Also, the proposed removal of a single funding and regulatory agency Bringing, bridging teaching and research is a cause for concern. For this would eliminate a body, the Higher Education Funding Council for England, which has shown considerable concern for philanthropy, helping to encourage its diffusion throughout the sector. Further, the Green Paper's encouragement to new providers of higher education may encourage, in respect of additional universities which are charities, competitors for higher education philanthropy, and in the form of for-profit institutions, a challenge to the prosperity of the whole existing sector and of its appeal to donors. Of course, all of these proposals in the Green Paper pose major questions for higher education, which go well beyond the topics associated with philanthropy. But for philanthropy itself, however, the most important aspects of pending policy changes will, I think, probably be monetary. 
As I noted earlier, it's crucial to the future of philanthropic giving to higher education in this country that such donations add reliably to the resources of higher education rather than making up for cuts. Also fundamental is the perpetuation of the tax breaks, which after all were threatened at, threatened at budget making time only a few years ago during the coalition government. The perpetuation of the tax breaks for giving to higher education, and arguably their enhancement as, a, as has been recommended by repeated reviews. And with regard to another relevant aspect of emerging government policy, I think it's important that universities not be caught up in the backlash against the hounding of donors by certain charities. Universities must publicize the care that they take, above all in relation to their alumni, to protect their contacts from unwanted attention. Finally, I turn to the topic of what should be the research questions about philanthropy, and I do so with some trepidation in this particular audience. Many of the issues touched on earlier in this talk are relevant to this emerging agenda, insofar as these topics relate to ongoing debates rather than settled issues. In addition, I would point to subjects I haven't discussed this evening. The varying appetites for fundraising of different types of higher education institution, for example, or the relative importance of alumni as against non-alumni donors, and within alumni of large versus moderate versus small donors. I also think there needs to be additional attention to the varying fruitfulness of campaigns, of annual funds, and of legacies. And we also need to keep looking at, a much more general to at much more general topics, such as the net moral balance of philanthropy, which comes from money derived from profit-making activities, the underlying uh, moral philosophy of higher education philanthropy, if you will. But these topics are merely to scratch the surface of a field which, as Charles Caden pointed out in his article last year in the Times Higher, has very wide-ranging implications. In conclusion, I attempt a brief answer to my overall question. What role should philanthropy play in British higher education? In my view, the prosperity of British universities and colleges, their ability to fulfill their increasingly ambitious objectives, depends to an important extent on their ability to continue, and if possible to accelerate, the recent marked growth of UK academic philanthropy. Such giving is, of course, no panacea. Income from fees and other earnings, and especially in relation to research, income from government will remain more fundamental to the annual accounts of UK institutions. Also, and of course I've spent a fair bit of time on this, there are possible pitfalls which must constantly be guarded against. Likewise, there are practical difficulties, not least the impact of changing government policies and the need to expand the emerging profession of higher education fundraising. But there are increasingly well-established ways of guarding against many of these problems. Above all, the record of UK higher education fundraising, especially though not only during the past 20 years, 10 to 20 years, is very promising. And in my view, these opportunities should be seized insofar as they are compatible with the overall values and strategies and procedures of UK universities. Thank you.